Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals Podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals Podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and my guest today is the extraordinary musician, artist, composer, and storyteller, Deborah Henson Conant. Nominated for a Grammy for her music special, Invention and Alchemy, which was broadcast on PBS, Deborah is most recently the composer and book writer of the new two hander musical, The Golden Cage. The musical won Best Musical Score, Best Actor, and Most Innovative Production at the 2022 Off-Broadway Create Theatre New Work Series, where it was also filmed live. The Golden Cage is now available on demand on streaming musicals. Welcome, Devora. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Truly delighted to be chatting with you today. To start us off with, what made you fall in love with musical theatre? Oh, well, uh, I, I fell in love with stories with music and I fell in love. With, I mean, singing was my first language. Uh, my family was really, really split, but every single person in my family sang and they sang to me. And I think I'm more comfortable. I would be more comfortable singing everything we're saying because that's the language I grew up with. So it's just for me, uh, it just makes perfect sense. I mean, stories with music allows all the dimensions of story, the emotions inside, the heightened language and and then and then the music that that gives the that gives an atmosphere that gives a character so you feel everything and so i think that's what i fell in love with my mother was an opera singer and my father sang musical theater and everybody sang like everybody sang that we didn't i didn't grow up with recorded music maybe we had i don't know i i just th there was always singing i was always playing the piano for fun i mean i didn't really read music but i could accompany people and there was just always singing together that was how people communicated did you grow up here in the us i did i grew up all over i mean my my i was born in california my parents the the it, the story goes that my parents courted by singing to each other, but that doesn't necessarily make for a great marriage. They split when I was little. And then for some reason, I don't know why we moved every year after that. Always a different reason, but I was at a different school from the time I was started school all the way until I got into high school. But that was great. I mean, I mean, well, who knows? You know, as you're as a kid, you you experience whatever you experience, but it let me meet a lot of new people. And <laughs> and I think that got me really comfortable. I'm thinking, you know, it got me comfortable with being on stage. It got me comfortable with meeting new people, but not necessarily comfortable with having really long relationships. So once I started having long relationships, I just I'm now in, you know, in touch with everybody that I can be from my childhood. Mm. And was your mom performing as you were growing up as, as a as an opera singer? So my mother and my aunt were both um, amazing performers. My aunt actually went off to New York and she did opera and musical theater and has made a living doing that. My mother um, had me and my brother. And so the, I don't know if we truncated that, but those two things are actually really important to me because I grew up seeing these incredible performers. And t two things happened. No, first of all, my mother, who was not necessarily getting the notoriety that she would have liked to have, I became her audience. So one day years ago, I was sort of bemoaning the fact, oh, my mother never got discovered. And then I thought, wait a second, I discovered her. My life was changed by her. Doesn't matter how many people were moved by her, but this was a woman who could walk into a room and say, I'm going to tell you a story. And she would tell me the story of an opera. She would put on this music minus one. I think I, that's what it used to be called. Music minus one is like karaoke for opera. And she would become the opera. And that became this experience of transformation that I got to see and that just became so magical for me. And that is actually relevant in terms of the golden cage in a couple of ways. First of all, I saw these powerful, powerful women transforming reality over and over again, but also I saw them over and over again, not getting roles because they didn't look right because they were both tall or big. And so one of the things as a kid, I just thought that is not 
okay. There's all this magic that's not going out into the world. And there's all these amazing performers who are not getting, having a vehicle. And so as soon as I knew that I was going to be writing music, I was like two things. Number one, nobody will ever tell me whether I can go on stage and perform something because I'm going to write my own music and I'm going to cast myself all the time. So that, that was really important for my career because I ended up playing the electric harp, which is relevant to the golden cage actually, and reinventing the harp and creating all the music that allowed me to go on stage and to tell the stories that I wanted to, they allow me to tell the stories that I want to tell. But I also swore that I would create music that shows where it didn't matter whether the care, you know, the age, the race, the body type, the gender, that the story was what was important and that any two great performers or even any one great performer could create this musical. So first I started doing, you know, one person musicals, but then I, you know, with the golden cage, it's, it's huge. It's twice as big. It's two people, <laughs> um, but, but that's really important. Now, in the film version that we see, it is a man and it is a woman. They both happen to be young performers. That's what happened. But it could be done by any two performers. And that comes directly out of my childhood, out of seeing how much amazing, magical, transformational talent is not being seen in the world just because someone doesn't fit. Mm. Oh, what a, that's so powerful and so... Why, why can't more people be have your mindset <laughs> that, you know, it doesn't matter like what the body looks like. It's the story that matters and the music that matters. That's right. And, and I mean, I have it that that's true for absolutely any musical because I mean, a suspension of disbelief. We're in a theater. There's 10 or 20 or 100 or 1000 people next to us. We're suspending disbelief about where we are and looking on a stage. So if we can't suspend the disbelief that the, you know, about the characters that we're seeing and even what gender they are, then we're just not using our imagination. But I know that that's easier for me than it is for other people, just because of what I grew up with. So people think, and, and also because some shows are about how people, a, a type of person, like, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine, but I'm, I know that there I, I know that there are musicals that are about specific things. But now that I'm saying that aloud, they could be about all you have to do is say, hello, I am no matter what you look like. Hello. Right now, I am a five foot tall um, Japanese woman. And if and an, I mean, I personally love to let my imagination say, OK, got it. Or right now, I am a 30,000 foot high flame throwing dragon. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Fine. Okay. Now I'm a worm. I get, sorry. I don't want to go. <laughs> but this is just, uh, it, it opens up our imagination and then, it, and then things become universal and inclusive rather than non-universal and, and specific. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned earlier that your dad sang musical theater. Was he a professional performer as well? Nope. No. And I didn't live with my dad, um, mm. that, but that was our language that we spoke together. And he loved musical theater, ended up becoming a judge. He'd been a, came out of a farmer. My, my two grand, my two families were Swedish farming people and Russian Jews who escaped from Europe. And that was actually beautiful as well, because they gave me two sides of the power of art and of music. So on my mother's side, you know, to be a musician and especially to be an opera singer was just magnificent. That is how you brought meaning into the world. But on my father's side, my grandmother, Edith, uh, who would put me into the wheelbarrow and wheel me down to the garden and sing to me, she said, she said, no, and she, people, people have, people got to sing and someone has to keep them together. And that's why I play the piano. Mm. So there was this, um, this dichotomy, but no, a, a paradox, a richness of the meaning and the use of art, of music, where it fits in the world. And what it can do for us. And so it sounds very much that music and art were like an integral part of your childhood and an integral part of your upbringing. Was attending 
like formal theater, like an in-person theater or opera also part of that upbringing? No, no. It's funny. I, I didn't listen to records. I didn't have music lessons. I didn't go to formal theater, but it, it was just the way of life. It was the way that things were explained. It was the way that we engaged. It was like a way of living. It's not like we were in a tribe or anything. We were just like <laughs> um, American people. Um, but but I think there was that, I don't know. I don't know why it was that way, but I grew up with live music all the time. Mm. When did you become aware of theater as an institution or opera as an institution? Uh, theater as an institution. I, I was a, I was aware of it because I remember my mother, well, I remember I wrote my first musical when I was 12 and I, and you know, there was an assembly and I got to be the star and I got to be out there acting. And I loved that. And I remember being 10 and, you know, being on the stage, you know, playing my guitar. And I remembered that feeling of what it means to be on a stage and what freedom that creates and the different universe that that creates. There's something about that. So I became aware of that, but I do not like sitting in an audience. It's just extremely uncomfortable for me. It feels, and that's one of the reasons why it was so important, both with Invention and Alchemy, which you mentioned, which was my one woman orchestral show, and also with The Golden Cage, to film it, to bring people closer than the front row, to bring them onto the stage, because that's where I wanted to be. I remember when I was about 11, for the first time I, um, I, I'm sure I'd heard, listened to the radio in the car and stuff like that, but I turned the radio on at home. I was all alone and this incredible music came out of it. I know now it was Debussy's La Mer, but I didn't know what it was at the time. I'd never heard anything like that. I hadn't really heard orchestral music. And I, I remember the compulsion to get as, how close, Oh, how can I get closer? And I just tried to crawl into the stereo. I tried to crawl inside. And, and later on, when I started writing symphonic music as a soloist, so I could actually be on stage with the symphony orchestra, I realized that I had achieved that experience of being inside the music. And that's what I wanted to do when we created the film version of the golden cage. So it was live on stage in New York city and it was done just with piano and two actors and very, very simply, but brilliantly staged and costumed and brilliantly performed. But then we spent a year reorchestrating it, adding orchestration onto, onto it because that oh. I had it that doing that would create an analog to the live experience. Otherwise we would just be watching, um, a representation of it, but we could create a new experience out of it by adding that mm. to it. And this is another, so Paul Gordon, you know, Paul Gordon, he and I went to high school together and, uh -huh. uh, and we would go home to school and we would write musicals and we would write letters to Leonard Bernstein and that, that <laughs> we would write musicals with each other to each other. And um, when he first told me about streaming musicals, uh, the, the, when he was first creating it, I was like, that's it. That's the thing, because you create a new version of it. I'm, I always love to do that. Like I, I love having, I can play a solo version of something. I can play it with chamber orchestra. I can play it with a symphony orchestra. Each time it's different. And, and many or, classical composers do that. You know, you'll hear the theme in one way and then it gets done this way and then that way. And I, I just love following it around. So when he told me about streaming musicals, I was just like, that's it. That is exactly it. And he said, and he said he didn't remember saying this to me, but he was like, yeah. So you film it with piano and then you, you know, add the orchestration and so blah, 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 blah. And I was like, got it. And it was like, just like, got it. But, and then it took, of course, a couple of years to actually make that happen. But that vision was there all the time, that that is how you would make it powerful and fresh and new and not just a, um, that's how you bring people closer closer than the front row. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm very excited by this idea of not, not just capturing a performance and making it available on screen, that you're creating an entirely new way of seeing the production. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, like, for example, when I, uh, so I play the electric harp, and when I play something um, by myself, 
I, I will play it one way, but if I have a symphony orchestra, I'm going to play it differently. I'm going to u- utilize that resource. Like if they've got a per- an amazing percussionist, I'm going to have the percussionist play things that I normally would play on my own so that I'm, I'm actually engaging the resources of that medium. So playing solo is a different medium than a symphony orchestra. And mm-hmm. film is a different medium than live performance. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, other n- new things become available and certain things become unavailable. Like randomness, random something that happens that night is no longer available with a film. But being able to enhance the experience through orchestration does become available. Mm. Oh, this is very fascinating and such a not a way I've heard of approaching a capture before that it's like like adding new orchestrations in the in the film is really interesting to me that it's uh that that is not what the live audience would have heard but then when we watch the film that we get a different experience that's akin to what the people in the theater would have had but we like you said we're like we get to dive in in a way that the people in the theater may not have experienced yeah it's an equivalent impact but a different experience using the mm. same piece and and I've had people who came to the, um, you know, who saw it live and then they see it on film and they're like, whoa, I, I was even more fascinated. And I don't think they were more fascinated because it's better as a film. I think they were more fascinated because the show is one of those shows that opens up and each time you see it, you see new things to it. But mm-hmm. also because the orchestration, even for me, as the orchestrator would give me something each week and he'd have me go look at a scene. And I was like, I never saw that in the scene. I never saw that that happened. I would realize that something about his orchestration helped me to open up to see more or different. And, and it was just, it just added this other richness that in the theater is created by the liveness. How involved were you with the editing of the film? Um, uh, not as much as I would have liked to be. <laughs> you know, and you can see my hands are like going. So I, so the, uh, I play the harp and the harp is like the most hands-on instrument you can like possibly play and fingers on. And there's a reason for that. And that's because my hands are just a really important part of my experience of life. And so it, um, having to edit the film through saying, um, please do this thing here instead of actually doing it myself was one of the most painstaking, painful experiences of my life. I just wanted to get my hands on it. Um, but the value of doing it that way is that then you get to work with an expert who has can see all kinds of other things that I can't see. So is your next uh, next string to your bow is, is going to be film editing? <laughs> No, absolutely how to edit not. Film. <laughs> no, no, it's learning how to communicate about editing film in a way that allows the film editor to do their expertise and allows me to communicate better because I that that uh, there should be a class for people like me for that in just how to say what it is that you want. And that's something that I learned in working with the orchestrator because I am an orchestrator and yet. I found that when I said to the orchestrator, oh, try using uh, this here, oh, have this come in, and I would describe exactly what I wanted, and he would do it, it wasn't effective. But when I told him the effect that I wanted, when I spoke in those words, so that then he could make the artistic decisions to, to fulfill my vision, not my specific do this, do that, then that was, I think that's why the orchestrations are so effective. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, my, my mind is blown that what was filmed was with the piano and that the orchestrations have been added in later because there's, it's so, it feels holistic. Like it, you, you can't tell that the singers aren't singing to what is what we're hearing. Well, there's a real reason for that. So the the, um, the man who did the orchestrations, his name is Tim Maurice. And this kind of goes back to the development of, the, of this piece, because it's a piece that I started writing very young. I mean, it came, it, it came out of literally a question that I had, which was, is my life going to be about security or is it going to be about freedom? And like I was 19 when I had that question. And those, that question literally popped out of my head, became two characters 
on either side of this of the bars singing to each other here i am in my golden cage growing thin growing pale like it was a it was this question became a and b became alpha became and beta then became althea and boris singing this thing you know she's singing here i am in my golden cage growing thin growing pale there you are on the outside looking in and he's singing here i am at your palace gate in a state of despair there you are on the inside looking out you know so there's there the the question became the characters which makes perfect sense because i grew up thinking in musical theater and then that became literally a lifelong exploration because what i didn't realize at the time i mean i i ended up um, you know making a version of the show then but then there were a lot of holes in it and i and i went on okay i'll just tell you the story i was sitting there i was 19 this question came up came out of my head got these two characters i'm like wow this is this is a musical and then i'm sitting there and i'm like but wait it's like a big musical i don't know how to read music or write music i could play it i could invent it i could be on stage but i did not know the technical aspect of writing it down and i thought i have to go back to school and learn to do this so I found a school um, near me. I was living in Marin County then, and there was this, there was a great music department in the Marin Junior College or whatever, community college, like a really great music department. And so I went there to study, to learn how to write this thing out, and um, they needed a harpist. And I'd had a couple lessons on a bunch of le instruments as a kid, so I became the harpist. And um, the long and short is that I discovered that I... <laughs> Looking back, I see what happened. I actually took on the character of Boris, the person who's free and looking for security. And the harp became that to me. You know, I mean, this is this. It's this incredible instrument you can play when you play it. It sounds like flying. I mean, it's just this amazing instrument. And I then over the course of time, I mean, I played this big concert harp and then I felt constrained by it. I wanted to wear it. You, you look at it, it looks like wings. It looks like both wings and a prison at the same time. So I became one of the characters through the harp. The harp gave me freedom. When I'm on stage playing the harp, I am so free. It, it, it's like, I've never experienced anything like that. I literally feel like I'm flying. Mm. But all the time there was this other side of me that had this show um the, this story that i wanted to tell and that story was stuck so i was literally living these two characters my whole life and uh, and unraveling with it uh, unraveling the story and being able to find and sing parts of the story because i was experiencing them so the show started in one way and then over time the other themes came back in. I actually just did a TEDx talk about this that's not out yet as of the speaking, but it's about the four questions that every time I would workshop the piece, there were these four questions that people would be, they would be like, well, wait a second, why is a bird, a bird person looking for a cage? Like I wouldn't, but I knew he was. I knew he was searching for that cage for some reason. And then they would be like, well, why does he, push her off the cliff because at one point there's this really dramatic moment where um, he pushes Althea off the cliff like that's evil I don't like him people would be like and 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 like they didn't like the show because they didn't like him but I knew it had to happen and then they were like why does she suddenly fly that doesn't not realistic but I knew it had to happen and then the finally like what what how, how does the cage get unlocked and I couldn't answer these questions and so, but I kept moving forward with them. And then, um, and then one day, um, so I had this big harp career. I was known as a harpist, like that's how I was defined. And I was at a harp festival and a, a man walked up to me and he said, um, you must be really proud of your career. And I was like, yeah. He said, are you happy? And I was like, well, uh, yeah, but, and I told him the story of the golden cage and how I hadn't completed it. And he said, well, would you be happy if um, if it was on Broadway getting awards? And I said, I would be happy if I was working on it 30 minutes a day. 
And he said, okay, I'm holding you to that. And he became this like accountability buddy for me. And then one day I got a late start and it was like 1145 and I got this, oh, no, sorry, it was like 1159. I got this text from him saying, if you do not send me your 30 minutes today, I am gonna, you will burn in hell. <gasps> And I laughed. I laughed really hard. Dramatic. <laughs> well, yes, I laughed. But what I realized is, oh, my God, somebody, this man believes in my vision and is more committed to my vision than I am. And I realized he was pushing me. And suddenly there was an answer to one of the questions, which was, why does Boris push Althea off the cliff? And because she asked him to. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I'm giving away some of this stuff, but I, I don't think it matters. It's not like, because people watch this over and over and over again, and the show keeps opening up. You don't, it's not about the plot. It's about the experience. So I began to understand why, why he had pushed her and why pushing each other becomes such a huge part of this show. And you can see when you look at it, there's a moment when each of them says, push me to the other, that it's like, it stops. And they're just like, push me, you know, push me, Boris, push me, take me to the edge and show me that I can fly. You know, let me take the leap of believing Mm -hmm. that they need each other for that. So that was the first question that I answered. And then but there were still all these others. And um, so I went to a dramaturg and uh, and I said, OK, so why does the bird want a cage? I know it does, but I don't know why to I don't I know he does. And he said, well, you, you're going to have to go back and look at your own backstory. You need to know his backstory. And so I went back and I looked at like, what were the stories that I heard as a kid? And I heard all these stories about um uh, people wanting to be artists. My mother wanted to be an artist, but she never made it. My grandmother wanted to be an artist, but her mother forbid her, or her father forbid her. And I realized there was all this, like, I want this, but I can't have it. And so I thought there's something in Boris's backstory. There's something that something that came down generationally. The story of the golden cage must have come back. And so there's a song. I don't think I'll be able to play it on the harp, but it, but it's something. But I'll do the best I can. He sings something like, "My father sang the tales to me every night when I was small of those who left to find the cage returned in shame." I'm not even singing the harmony. I can't on the harp. <laughs> but not at all. And snug inside our little... So he says, my snug inside our little nest, my mind inflamed with cage and quest, I swore I'd be the one to prove the myth was true, that I would find the golden cage, the sweet, elusive glory of a place where you belong. The greatest test of a glorious quest, the hallowed ground where all the light you've lost is found. The golden cage. So then I knew that, you know, he'd been told these stories ever since he was a little child. And um, and you can also see that if you see the musical, my harmonic vocabulary in the musical is so much broader than what I can do on a harp. So a harp gives me physical freedom, but it like can, oh, I just get like all the notes aren't there. <laughs> but, that, but that's also beautiful. So anyway, little by little, I answered the questions and coming back to Tim Maurice, there was a certain time at which I just couldn't move forward. And I asked I found this guy, Tim, who lived around the corner from me. I said, can you come over to my house 30, uh, for three and a half, two and a half hours a week and just play whatever I have of this musical? And so he came over and he just kept playing it. And t- little by little, we just put it together. We put it together. Finally, we did a, a workshop of it. And then, um, you know, we did another workshop of it, another workshop. Of it, and he came to know the show so well that we could literally compose together. Like I could stand next to him and say, Tim, play this theme. Okay, put it up. A se- okay, yeah. And then add the other theme. And Okay, great. Okay, now we got, okay, play that back. And he would be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, so he couldn't come to New York. He couldn't be the music director there. And we got this wonderful, wonderful guy named Nevada Lozano. But then what Tim's always wanted to do and what Tim is great at is 
movie soundtracks. And so once it was finished, he knew the music, he knows the music better than anyone in the world, even better than me. And so he became the orchestrator. And this comes back to your question. Sorry, it's a long, a long journey back there. But it comes back to why the orchestration sounds so organic. So what he did is he went in and the first thing he did is he cl created a click track to the music that was there because it's very sung very freely. And, um, and then he went in and he orchestrated it line by line. He played line by line in. Wow. And were the was it was the music record the sorry were the orchestrations recorded with live instruments or is that through no. digital music? No, it's all digital. But it's, wow. it's but it's it's really beautifully done and it's done with the human feeling because he literally played each of them in. Mm. Wow, I I'm really interested in this idea of what the golden cage is a symbol for mm -hmm. and this idea of freedom and security mm -hmm. and this, the longing to, to have the life of an artist and what, what that means. And this, the idealized life of an artist versus what it means to be an artist. Right. Um, can you explore that a little bit for us and how I'm curious, like you've talked about how you didn't have formal music training until later and mm -hmm. how that impacted your, like, your ability to go out and be an artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Okay. There's a bunch of questions there. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just start with formal training. I think one of the values of not having had formal training is that it became a, just a spoken language for me. There was no, no, I didn't know anything about notes. I, mean, I knew there were notes, but I didn't really know anything. I do know that when I was about 14 I wrote this music and I wanted it to be I wanted to ent enter it I wanted to enter it in a contest and you had to write it out and I remember my stepfather I was like how do you write music and I just remember him coming and saying well there's middle c on the piano and there it is on the staff and you go up or you go down <laughs> and that was pretty much all I knew so so language and music and feeling um were just, they weren't codified in any way. They were about enhancing life. It, it, no, it's not about enhancing life. It was about trying to express the a reality I was feeling through music. Mm. And so I think not having formal training in the beginning helped me to be able to have my own vocabulary. I have less of my own vocabulary on the harp. I, I do have it, but but it's not quite as free because I did have formal training on the instrument. But getting the formal training later, um, it's 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 like painstaking <laughs> because I'm still not great at it. I, I can't really read music very well. Um, but but there are so many more tools now than there used to be. I mean, I've written for symphony orchestra because there are tools and because for me, everything is a voice. And when I do play with a symphony and I'm talking to the musicians, I'm like, you are each characters. So the bassoon, you're this guy that does this percussion. You're the thing that does this. And so that's just the way that I'm looking at it. And that's the way I talk to them about it. So that's, what I have to say about not having formal training, it, it doesn't matter when you get into your life, you're just going to have a, a different experience. Although I do train people now who come from formal training and are trying to break the constraints of formal training and also trying to understand the fundamentals so they can more easily express themselves. So there's that. Then you asked something about, you asked some, what did you ask? Uh, something that the like the the idea of um the golden cage is a metaphor for this idealized life of an artist versus what it's like to actually be an artist i never thought about about it that way but it's it's actually great because it I'm, so I was living these two lives. I was living this fairly stuck life of Althea in trying to move this show forward or, you know, um, just the pain of writing out music for other people to perform when it was so much easier to just like get there and do it myself, which is how there was this whole other um, side of me that became my persona um, of being that free, fearless, would do anything um, and in part, I was able to develop that. I mean, and I even developed this new instrument, 
which is a wearable harp. And I did it in order to ex have that experience that I knew I had to have of freedom, of being able to play and move. And that's the Boris experience. But the Althea, Althea experience is, is being stuck, knowing you're stuck, not even necessarily remembering how it is that you got stuck. And But I, one of her favorite things, um, and I wish I could play it, um, I could like make up a, a you know a harmony or something like that, but it's it's well I'll try it because why not? Um, something like I used to dream. At least I think I used to dream. I dreamt I was in flight. I used to dream. I dreamt of soaring on a starlit night. But now I only dream, I dream, I dream of dreaming again, 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 again. So that, that's her experience of being stuck. So those are the words she sings. She sings a different harmony and a different melody in, in the music. Um, I mean, in the, in the musical. And yeah, and one of the things that was so powerful for me, I, I remembered that experience of these two halves of me splitting out A and B, Alpha, Beta, Althea, and Boris. But it wasn't until I watched the film, and we did a lot of um, private screenings each time we were trying the orchestration over, 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 over so many times. So I had to watch it each time all the way through. And I asked other people to watch it with me so I could focus. And there's a moment at the end where the two characters are holding hands. And of course, I'd seen it before. But one night, I just, something clicked. And I remembered, I saw that moment where they're connected. And then I saw that moment in my life where they had split apart. And I realized that some, you know, these two parts of me, which had split, had come back together. Mm. And this show had made that happen. And the writing of this show and the unlocking of this show had allowed me to, um, to navigate this life. And I, I, you, I talk about the golden cage all the time in therapy sessions. Like I'm always <laughs> saying to my therapist, well, right now I'm at the moment when Althea is trying to put the trumpet to her lips and you know, that's how that feels. But at the same time, I'm also falling off the cliff. Like, you know, and, and it's great that at least my therapist has seen the film now. So she knows what I'm talking about, but it's an incredible to be able to live with one story your whole life and unlock that story, the meaning of the story. And now what's happening now that the story's out there and I'm having conversations with people about it. Like I have these conversations called unlocking the golden cage, where I'll talk with someone who's writing a book about where these themes show up in their work mm -hmm. or, you know, how they saw them in, in, in the show or whatever. Now, suddenly there's just this Oh, it's like oh, it's like the other it's like it's like the show is blooming the ideas are blooming first I was getting them into the ground and being able to ground them so they could grow and now that bloom is starting to happen mm. oh another beautiful metaphor I'm really curious about so we, you've talked a little bit about the music and and how like over time it has evolved and how it's like you're literally telling the story of your internal self which how powerful that is where do the the lyrics come from and what is your oh. what's your background in in the written word that's another art form in itself right so and by the way what happened and I don't know how to describe this but I was I am telling the story of what's happened to me but I didn't know I was telling the story I, mm -hmm. I I've discovered later on that I was telling the story but that actually goes back to a, a concept I had a long time ago about the world authors. Whenever I wanted to know something, I'd go to the world authors and they would, they would, they weren't creating the world, but they were writing, writing the, writing the meaning of the world as it was happening. I don't even know how to describe it, but now that you're asking that, I feel like I was sort of living that with the show. Um, so um, stories, uh, I mean, words with music to me, words, Every word has music. Uh, 
like there's a song uh, sorry I'm doing everything in the key of C I hope that's okay for everybody <laughs> listening I can go into E flat if people want um, but every every okay so in order to oh, there's so many answers to that question but let me just start here I have it that a words are music words are music like words words are music words are music when you say them in your mouth they expand what you're thinking if you say them different ways any word could become what you're feeling but you have to say them to discover that so to me it is, it is discovery it's discovery and to understand what what is happening in this moment like okay so so um there was a moment in the play where i didn't understand it goes back to this question i didn't understand i i get that he pushes her off the cliff. I get that she flies, but I was like, I didn't know how, how, how does that, I don't, why? And it was bugging me and it was bugging other people who were seeing the, the workshops. And so to answer that question, and I wish I had a piano in front of me because um, I could then play it, but I went to that moment and then I looked at the words. So I guess I'll play what I can. I thought... No, I thought that I would die. I felt the world slip away. There was nothing I could grasp. I was free falling through the night. I saw the ground. I saw it race. The ground was galloping like stallions at my face. I was a fool. How could I leap? How could I ever have believed? How could I leave it all behind? And now it's gone, gone, gone. So that was just me like going into that moment. Like, what would that be like? What would I be experiencing? I'm falling off a cliff. And that leads to this moment where, and I won't be able to play the harmonies, but, but, but she says, and so I opened up my arms. To embrace the end of everything. I hung above the earth. Boris, I hung above the earth. I felt the I felt the I felt the wind. Uh, I, 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 I can't even <laughs> I'm, I'm losing it. Oh, but she I felt the wind, I felt it everywhere. I was lifted to the sky. I could fly. And then and then she turns around and she says, and so I turned and I saw the mountain. It grew impossibly high up in the sky and in the highest peak, the glint of gold and sunlight. And I saw all at once. I saw my life as I had been when I was small, when I had heard the story of the greatest gift of all, and I had sworn before I died that I would find myself inside, my way inside, that I would be the one to prove the gift was true, to prove the myth was true, that I would find the golden cage. I always dreamt about it as a child. And in that moment, I realized of yeah, that's why she could fly because she'd always been a bird person. She that she too had like locked herself in the cage. She also, you know, and and of course, in that moment of surrender, literally mechanically, when she's in the cage and you see them, when they're in the cage, they're wearing this 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 thing that covers them up. But in that moment, she's like, and so I opened up my arms, and you know, you in that moment, boom they're there like literally they're there and so the moment of surrender and sorry I, 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 the question you were asking was the, the lyrics so i always have that if you can just 
tell the truth, tell as much truth with the most exact words you can. It's going to work. It doesn't have to rhyme. Sometimes it does, but, but the, the, the music is in the words and all you have to do is tell the truth and find that truth. And so that is the answer to that question Mm -hmm. um, that you asked. And as you're talking, I was thinking about in this production directed by Rebecca Rebecca Miller Kratzer and designed by Tyler R. Harold, Mm -hmm. this, how uh, the world of the golden cage, a lot of it is um, from the outside. It looks like this beautiful, rich, like it's full of music and art and, and um, like literal props like the helmet and everything right. and then when boris is inside the cage he realizes that it's all post-its that it's all like it's <laughs> right, all right, invention right. it's all imagination so this beautiful idea of the golden cage like being a physical like reality of the life of being an artist but also like the cages that we create in our minds of of what what restricts us in our own brain and like how our imagination is the limit Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's because the cage doesn't just look different to him on the outside. It literally is different. Mm -hmm. And and what happens and and as you hear this at the end of the show, what happens is he when he finally gets rid of her, um, he locks himself inside. And that is what makes the cage change. And once you lock yourself inside, it's not just that it looks like it's out of made out of granite and iron. It literally is made of granite and iron. Mm -hmm. And and he even says, but I know I can, I can know I can get out. Of course I can get out. I know I can get out, but he can't because, because it's when someone reaches in and you reach back, it's, and that goes, um, so and I just want to say one other thing that I think is so beautiful about Evan Prezant made the costumes. What I want to go back to in a second is that is a moment in the middle of the show when everything changes. Um, but Evan made these wonderful costumes. They're so beautiful. They have these mom- moments of when they're the character in a sense. And he made all, Alfia wears wigs and helmets. She's always trying to dress up to be, you know, something. And he made them all out of cardboard. Mm. And they're, they're just exquisite. Um, and she also labels everything because she, she can't remember anything. And then somebody somebody wrote to me and he said, you know, I love those post-it notes. He said, because it made me think like she had a she had one pack of post-it notes and this is what she decided to do with it, was just like label everything in her house. Um, but, the, but the thing that I love about um, Tyler's set is that he built the cage out of feathers and he built them out of white feathers. So they're they are both a huge part of the story, but they're also nothing. And they're also feathers with no color. And so you, as you're watching it, you see that Boris sees the cage as this gorgeous thing. Althea experiences the cage as something different. And we, we in the audience see that it is, it's nothing, it's feathers. And I was really curious, how were they going to do that? You know, we didn't, it, this isn't a huge production. I mean, it was a simple production. It was done with such creativity. It, it couldn't have been done more beautifully. And we were also wondering, like, what? he pushes her off the cliff. I, we only have one level. Like, how's he, where's the cliff? Where's she going to go? Like, bleh. And the way Rebecca staged it is chilling. It is one of the most powerful, powerful moments in the show when Althea falls off the cliff and what happens there and like i could i could describe it but it wouldn't have any of the impact that that the visual does and then the orchestration actually adds to that but i want to go to one moment and i can't remember if you asked about this or if i just want to talk about it because it's my most recent thing um it's because we were having a big discussion after the premiere and somebody was again being like i don't like boris because he pushed her off the cliff and or she, he pushed her off. Yeah, right. And um, and I was like, well, we all do things like that. And, and he, he kind of had to do it. And I knew he had to do it. But I thought, OK, wh- when did that happen in the show? When did that become inevitable? And and I went and looked at a part I had never looked at before, which is there's this middle thing. There's a moment when all the orchestration goes away, everything, everything stops. And it's this, it's called the acapella duet. And it starts just with almost like Gregorian chant. And then it, and and the two characters are almost touching, but not quite. And they're saying all my life, all my life, I've waited for this moment to believe for the simple pleasure, for the single moment of belief. And then it switches key 
and it becomes a, um, an, the parts are integrated with each other, not Gregorian chant like, and each of them is talking about trust, and 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 then it and then that it's like a time out of time, and then the show begins again, and becomes absurd and violent, and ultimately it resolves, and I was. And it resolves in, in, in a really deep, deep connection, not just of each other, but of, yeah, where they're, where they're, con where they're healing each other in a way, not intent. It's not like, hello, I'm going to heal you, but that's just what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I have it that in that moment, the split second of trust, everything changed. And after that, it was inevitable and unimportant what happens. It just had to happen in the quickest way that it would happen, that somehow she was going to remember who she was and she was going to reconnect with who she was. And somehow he was going to, they would each get free of where they were stuck. She would get free of the cage. He would get free of his obsessive ambition to find the cage. And they would be able to, in a sense, actually begin their lives. And so everything that happens came out of this one split second of trust. That's what I have. That's what I'm experiencing now. Yeah. And when you were talking about the feathers before, I was, it was also making me think that, again, that idea of being in your own head, that like the, the cages that we create is like our own flesh, like the, and the, the fact that these are birds, that's like their literal, the, their body is the cage, the, the feathers are their cage. Yes. And in fact, there's a, a last, the very last song that she sings. And I, again, I wish I could sing it. I'll try to sing it. You build your cage from dreams that died and every heartache that you ever held inside. You know, you forge the bars from every pain and sorrow you've known, and in your cage, you are alone. Mm. And, and, and then, but, but then she says, but, but wait, it's not the cage that traps you. It's when you lock yourself inside, and it's when someone reaches in, and he says, and you reach back. It's when you're, that's, that's when it unlocks and then they're like, okay, we got it. And <laughs> they're able to, you know, finally be free. And then there's just this last one last moment when when he needs her to push him. And then then it's complete. <sighs> and and I, I mean, I wish I could say I knew all of this when I started to build this. I was a designer, but I didn't. And that's been one of the luxuries. I mean, I've created a lot of things in my life, but um you know, and I completed them, they're completed and they're out in the world and they're being performed. But this has been, I had the opportunity to let it unfold and discover it over a lifetime. And I think that's why it's so rich and why people keep finding and people watch it over and over and over again and keep finding things and then bring somebody else back to watch it. And I think that's why. And I'm, I am so thankful that you have just you have chosen to make it available via streaming musicals because it's incredibly accessible anyone can log online to watch it um and at a very affordable price too which yeah. I, I think is so important um, yeah I, I just want to say that that's one of the beautiful things about streaming musicals it has two it can do two things number one gives total access to anybody but it also gives access to all the theater companies that might be interested in, in doing this production and lets them see how simply it can be done. And it gives access to every singer who's looking for a great project that they could do with another great singer. It gives them the opportunity to see the whole thing. And that's where we're going, which is, you know, I envisioning, I want to see all the Borises, all the Alphias in the world, because each one brings a different perspective, a different facet to this. Mm. And you've you had um, we talked about a little bit about invention and alchemy earlier that it was available on PBS and I I was watching one of your um, uh, the artist videos that you made in 2020 uh, when you were able to briefly re-release oh, that video online right, right. and you were talking about how um, the frustration of of uh although it was made available on dvd which at the right. time was the most accessible yeah, right. uh, format and now that you know no one really buys dvds anymore and, and right. the, the restrictions that are around um the rights to, to yep. be able to redistribute it what what would you say to other artists who are 
hesitant to put their work on film and make it available for, for a wider audience. I don't know why you would do that. I don't know why you would. Um, I mean, I mean, one of the beautiful things about streaming musicals is it doesn't cut down on the possibility to have live performances and each live performance is going to like open up something new. Um, I just have to say it was one of the most frustrating experiences of my life that I made this beautiful, you know, the, the thing that I got a Grammy nomination for is this beautiful, you know, show with full amazing symphony orchestra they were funny they were wore costumes i mean it was it's really spectacular and to not be able to share that because of um union restrictions i'm a union member so it's not like i'm like i don't like unions but it's just so frustrating and i've heard paul gordon talk about this as well mm -hmm. um that um it, it, it cuts down access and so things that that can't be seen and there's so many people who don't have access to coming to Broadway um, or or even some places that have no they don't have even have a local theater and so I don't know why I just don't know why um, you would want to make something inaccessible to people I, and, and and I've got to say, I mean, it's not like it was inexpensive and that's why I'm in the middle of a fundraising campaign and I will probably always be in the middle of a fundraising campaign mm -hmm. because it, it, it does cost money, but, it, and this was one of the things that Paul and I talked about early on, if you have a Broadway show, it, that costs money too and it costs money every single night. But this um, allows us to, to put that budget in. I can fundraise to, to get it paid for, and then it exists in the world. And I do want to say one other thing. One, one, a big turning point for me as a writer of this show was a moment when I created a 15-minute version of it that I could do myself, where I could narrate it and sing a little bit of the songs. And being able to have um, a mobile version of it that I could share with people, that was... Um, a watershed moment and and now being able to show the film itself is the, is like the next watershed moment there's n there there's no bar to entry anybody can look at it i don't know when people are going to be watching this but i will give you a code for your listeners to like get 25 percent off watching it streaming musicals thank you so much oh that's yeah. wonderful and we'll have we'll have a link to that in the show yeah. notes um and if folks want to take a re-listen to or access again for the first time um episode 11 of the film live musicals podcast i interviewed paul who's one of my earliest guests and uh talked about the development of streaming musicals and and why how his production of daddy long legs uh how that became uh the inspiration for for streaming musicals and how he he changed his mind about why filming live theater is so important yeah, and I, I was at that premiere and I was like, this is it. I, I was just like, I think Paul and I may have been the only two people in the world aside from um, Tom and Stacia who were just like, yeah, this is it. This is the future of musical theater. Let's do it. <laughs> of course, now there's, you know, you know, Hamilton is streaming and, you know, there's so, so many musicals out there. But but that all the more reason for people who are first beginning um, to get something that that can be shared. Mm. And uh, you talked about that um, the Golden Cage is now available for licensing and that you're excited yeah. to see future productions. What what do you see as the next iteration for the Golden Cage? Well, one of the things that I'm really loving about it is uh, what I call unlocking the Golden Cage. One of the things that we created was the un Cage Unlocker Journal to let, because I saw that people were having so many psychological and emotional sort of spiritual experiences with it the combination of those that I, uh, we made a journal as if, it, as if we had found Boris's and Althea's journal. The first half is Althea's journal with some of her prompts and then prompts for us to look back at our own lives, to fill that in. Um, and I did that in order to make it a little bit easier for people to look at their own lives and relationship. I had this fantasy that um, people would do that. And then, uh, then I would have like an online event where all these people who've done the cage unlocker journal would come and I'd put them into breakout rooms and people could talk about these things together. So I love that. And also creating, um, I mean, I, I mean, as a show, part of the power of it is any two great performers can do it. So that means any little theater company can do it. 
Um, any big theater company can do it. Opera companies can do it. Um, and it doesn't take this huge stage. And it is also for multi-generational audiences. And it's not that I was like, oh, we're going to make this musical. It's just like, this is what's important to me as a child. I needed to be able to, I wish that I'd had a way to talk about these things. And I wished I'd had something I could go to with my parents that they would enjoy, that all of us could enjoy and then talk about being stuck, looking for freedom, ambition. I, I didn't even have those words, so I didn't know how to talk about them. So I made this show as an, a way to do that. So how do I see it? My fantasy is that it becomes um, a way for any theater company to reach new audiences, to to raise money because the production costs are so low. And so it became, you know, okay, this goes back to what I said right in the beginning. You just realized this. This is the Edith, the Edith side of me. You know, the writing side of me was the Anna side of me, the side that's all about art. The Edith side of me is this is a working piece of theater. It's supposed to go in there and make it possible for this, 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 and this. <laughs> what I love about it, and it does, it makes it possible for, you know, families or multi, just any multi-generational or groups of people to be able to have a discussion. It makes it possible for great artists who don't fit other roles or who don't fit together in other roles to have a powerful thing to do. It makes it possible for companies to have whatever production they have going on over here. They can be doing the golden cage and you know, reaching new audiences with it, or they can put it on their main stage. It's a working piece of theater. Mm. And so that's how I see it being that it gets like, it's like a human being. It's a human being with a full, rich life. A human mm. with a full, rich life has a job. It's meaningful in the world where they're opening things up for themselves and others. And they are also a piece of art that gets to express itself. Mm. In the licensing version, the sorry, the licensed version, is the um, is the music the piano score or the full orchestrations? It's it's the piano score. The full orchestration doesn't even exist as written out music. Tim <laughs> created it onto yeah. the film. Um, but, but the next project that Tim and I are doing, when I very first created it, I made the show for piano, cello, and percussion. And mm -hmm. Paul and I have been talking about like what orchestration do we want to build? So it is very doable with piano and you don't notice that anything's missing. Yeah. However, it is also really fun with some of those soaring cello lines and it's really fun to have percussion. So Tim and I are, Tim is the one who did the orchestrations. That's our next project is to create a sort of a chamber music version of it so that when people license it, they can, they can make it small, really small with piano or, or increase it to a little bit larger. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh my goodness. I could keep talking to you about this all day. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are a little short on time. Uh, so this final segment is called My Favorite Things, where I ask you my favorite questions. These are a few of my favorite things. To start off with, what is your favorite musical? Well, um, I like musicals together, but I love The Music Man because it's about music, because it's about someone who tr who tries to be a flim flam person, but ends up doing something wonderful. And so Boris is a kind of a combination of, um, of The Music Man and, and, and La Mer by Debussy. Um, and I also love it because of the way that language in this, has, in this conversation, because of the way he gets into each song through different usage usages of language. Language. Mm. And that's why I Ooh. love it. What a great choice. I love that. Uh, do you have a favorite filmed live musical? So a musical that's been filmed on stage? Wow. The, I immediately thought of my least favorite, um, <laughs> which was The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Um, yeah, wow. I can only think of things I didn't like. Wow. Um, my most. Oh. No, I guess it would probably have to be West Side Story, hmm. but no, I don't know. It's just tough. Wow, that's a tough question. I'll think of, <laughs> I'm sure I'll think of the answer after I get off and then I'll be like, yeah. I wish I'd said that. You'll be lying in bed tonight be like, wait, I, know, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, a filmed live musical is not exactly a stage show and it's not exactly a movie. So what should we call it? Wow. Well, I call the Golden Cage an, ad an adaptation of mm -hmm. the live, um, but I would say it's a reinvention. 
it depends on how you do it. If, if you're just capturing what was there, that would be, an, I think, an adaptation. Um, but I would say if you do reinvent it, it's a reinvention. Mm-hmm. Where do you stand on bootlegs? Bootlegs. I, I don't think there's a need for bootlegs, sorry. <laughs> there's so much accessibility in, in, in non-bootlegged ways. I think that um, it's kind of like when you, when you think about alcohol, I mean, there was bootleg liquor at a certain time when liquor wasn't available, but it was no longer, I, I don't know, maybe they're still bootleg, but it, it wasn't necessary. I mean, streaming musicals has made it possible, you know, and other streaming has made it possible to get access. So mm-hmm. since there is access, then I would just say, no, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know what else I would say about bootlegs. Like what, what's the point? Mm-hmm. You're, it, it's uh, one step removed. You're not, you're not giving money to the artist. You're not seeing the original thing. Like you're just you're just not you're just disconnected if you're getting a bootleg. Mm. Uh, what stage musicals do you wish had been filmed live on stage? Well, I would have said the Golden Cage up until now. But, <laughs> well, wow. we have it now, <laughs> no, right? Exactly. Ah, oh, this is really hard. I don't know. How about you? Which do you wish? Which do you wish? Oh, everything. My my dream is to have like the box sets. Like I'm old school, like give me my DVDs. But I, you know, I would love the box set of Hello Dolly where we have everyone from Carol Channing, Pearl Bailey, Bet, like, you know, give 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 me all those performances in one big box set. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that idea. And I think that's something that a lot of people are like, well, so what? But that's one of the beauties of opera is that you've got a beautiful story mm-hmm. and then you get to go see different people do it. And I love that idea of all the different versions. But wow, I wonder if there even is like a film of Ethel Merman doing whatever, Annie Get Your Gun or something. Yeah, I there must be something in the archives. But, you know, on, she certainly did numbers on television, but I, I don't know that the original, like the actual Broadway productions were, were captured. That I would, dreamed. that would be wonderful. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Right. What would you like to see? What stage musicals would you like to see filmed in the future? Uh, these are tough questions for me because I, I don't go to musicals <laughs> I, I, because I, I don't know. I guess it's different for me. It's a, I don't like sitting in a theater. I don't know. I guess I would say every one of them. I I just like, th- I personally love this, um, what is it called? Genre. It's not a genre. It's, it's, a, it's a, a medium, which is the live thing brought closer than you could be if you were watching it live. That's mm-hmm. just like my thing. How do you get on stage right next to the thing that's just what I always want to know. So I would like to see everything like that. Everything like it, like it should just be a a part. I I would love it to be part of the workshopping process. Mm. Huh? Now I'm thinking about how I could do that with, with other musicals. I'm curious. This is a little bit off topic. It is related. Um, what your interest is in blending like film technology with live theater and with, with live music, like how is that something that you would consider after, especially after doing this project, is it something that you would consider for future work, bringing like that film element so that you can bring the kind of um, that digitization into the live, which allows people to be Mm. like on the stage with you? Uh, Oh, yeah, I've done that. It's interesting. I I have another musical that I did before The Golden Cage called The Frog Princess, um, which is about the daughter of, you know, the the woman who kissed the frog and and her (laughs) husband and frog. And this daughter is afraid that she's going to become a frog like her father. Um, And I did. And in order to get that done quickly, I oh, I did it in the way of Peter and the Wolf because I was also doing a lot with symphonies. Mm. So I told the story and I wanted to act all the characters. So I told the story, act all the characters. I, I'll, I'll send you a copy of that. But that, oh, yes, was, that, was a, yeah, that was another way to tell a story. I mean, I'm about telling stories with music. That's it. That's all I care about. I'm going to find ways to do that. Bring um, technology. I personally... I mean, I love it when people when when I go to play somewhere and they've got those cameras that, you know, people can see that my fingers and stuff like that. That's great. Um, but I personally love 
Ah. I love it when there's so little. I mean, another reason why I love playing a harp I can wear. Woman goes on stage wearing a harp creates a world. Like that's creates a world through story, music, and her fingers, um, or story singing and her fingers. To me, that is magical because that's that was what I experienced. The, the very first magic I experienced in my life. Woman comes into the room, puts on music minus one, creates a world, and that world is suddenly there. That's mm. magic. And that's that's like the most elemental, like sitting around the fire telling a story. That's like you can't get more element human and elemental and theatrical than that. Right. Yeah. That yeah. that's where it all begins. And if you can if you can live in that then it's like the whole world is open. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful note to end on. Finally, where can we find you online? Um, so the, you can find The Golden Cage at goldencagemusical.com. And you can find me at hipharp.com, which is hip as in cool, harp as in the instrument. And the harp is the greatest storytelling instrument. And it does allow you to actually be a musical. So having having had these two things all my life has just been such a rich, <laughs> what a rich experience. Mm. Oh, Deborah, thank you so much for yeah, your time. Thank this has you just been so delightful. Much. It, wonderful, wonderful questions. So fun to listen to all the podcasts that you've done. And I'm just so honored to be on it. And it, just thank you so much. The Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. Filmedlivemusicals.com is where musicals come home. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Shout out and all the thank yous to our wonderful patrons, Josh Brandon, Geraldine Brewer, Belinda Broido, Andy Capone, Elliot Charles, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Hannah Graneman, James T. Lane, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, Joe Tilliston and Beck Twist. Patrons generously provide financial support to preserve the history of film stage musicals and the creation of one easy place to find them all. If you would like to support the site, receive early access to this very podcast and early access to site content, become a Film Live Musicals patron for as little as $3 a month. Visit filmlivemusicals.com to learn more. If you like what you hear, please leave a review on Apple Music. It really helps to get the word out about the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thanks for listening.